Hey everybody, welcome to this Divine Innovation video. We're gonna have a discussion today about groups. Really excited about uh, being able to share with you today. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified of all these awesome videos that are coming out from Divine Renovation. I'm here with my friend, Rob McDowell. Rob is one of the coaches with Divine Renovation. My name is Eric Myatt. I'm the Canadian coordinator with Divine Renovation. So Rob, we're gonna talk today about groups. We've had a lot of churches wondering, okay, what am I doing next after Alpha? Uh, how can I build and grow groups? What are the purpose of groups? So maybe you could start us off. Why are groups important? Yeah, for a while, a lot of our churches were, were feeling kind of uh, a tension point around around groups for, for multiple reasons. Some of our churches, um, you know, we're seeing uh, not a lot of retention after Alpha. Our group approach is probably something that's still in the process of changing. I'd say it's not fully changed. We're still grappling with a lot of it. But I guess it was in response to some challenges that we had. After Alpha, we weren't able to get everyone into groups fast enough. There was just so many. Um, and some of the reasons for that was because of um, a leadership bottleneck, finding the right leaders to be able to start our mid-sized groups. Um, and then also that discipleship groups were competing with life groups. And so that a lot of people would say, well, no, I haven't got time for both, so I'll just do a discipleship group, learn about some aspect of the faith, and then not do life with people, other people, what we call life groups, other people call connect groups. And then the other thing was getting the right fit, like getting people in where when it just didn't quite, they didn't have connections with people that was natural. So sometimes it felt a little bit like shoehorning. And then on top of that, when COVID hit, all of a sudden, you know, pastors and church leaders started to feel a lot more pressure of, you know, hey, how can we get how can we get people connected in this season? And, you know, some churches that were starting to reopen, they were seeing people not come back for fear issues and, you know, things like that. So there's just a lot of different reasons why churches have, have kind of been feeling the need uh, to, to step in and experiment with some approaches to groups in a new way. And so a lot of it was they were just feeling the need to really find some ways to help people get connected. You know, they always talk about how crisis leads to innovation and, and there's opportunities in the midst of crisis. And I think for us, that was one of the big opportunities was the, the need to connect people. People were dispersed, not able to connect. And so we as a church wanted to help people connect. And we really went all in with online groups, helping people to connect in online groups. Now, I know there's some people, including a lot of us that work in church or in leadership, who are talk about being Zoomed out. Um, and there are many people who feel that, but there are also many people who are very isolated and are loving the connection that they're experiencing in groups online. So this up from the pandemic up through now here in December, we went all in with online groups. And as we look ahead to the spring, because of all the uncertainty, we have projected that for the most part, groups will continue to be online. And then we'll work at you know, how we transition back and what hybrid models might be afterwards. The disconnection through the pandemic has been pretty severe. And a lot of people are looking for, okay, how do I connect with folks from my community, folks from my church in a way that's meaningful, purposeful, directive, and that's where groups come in. Also, like you said, folks come through Alpha and a lot of churches are now running Alpha online, which is amazing and, and huge response to some churches saying, we've had the biggest one ever in this season. We've been able to connect with people like we've never been able to before. And now we're in a place where, okay, what's, what's next? We've had uh, this big turnout. How do we continue to keep people connected? In the 10 years we've been doing Alpha, we're probably 3,500 people through Alpha, which is just an incredible number. But then we, when we ask ourselves, where are these 3,500? We can uncomfortably say that we don't know where 80 or 90% of these people are. We, we had no dedicated next step for them. And guess what? When you light a bit of a fire under somebody at Alpha, if you don't give them that dedicated next step, if you don't keep walking with them, they just drift away. And it was, it was breaking our hearts. Too often, as you mentioned, folks come in, they have a positive experience at Alpha, they're excited about next steps, but we don't have a means through which to continue their growth uh, towards conversion, towards missionary discipleship in a way that's easy, straightforward, and good. So 
Can you share a little bit more about the why of of groups? Like, why are groups important to the life of a church? Inherently, as as humans created in the image of God, we're relational beings. And so he's, you know, he's created us that way to connect with other people. Our parish priest, Chris, uh, asked all of the staff, what was the one most important thing that they thought we needed to get right before Christmas? That was in about August or September. And nearly everyone spoke about the same thing, that sense of disconnection that people had, not being able to come back to church or being too afraid to come back to church. That's when we decided to run a Connect series. You know, I mean, even if you go back to the the book of Genesis, before sin ever entered the world, it's not good that man be alone, right? And so we see we see our need for relationship. And, and on top of that, as, as you kind of continue to understand and develop that, you see within the New Testament, you see this whole idea of our faith being intersected with the whole idea of community. One of the ways that it's been put to me is God's plan A of how he wants to work in my life and your life is through other people. Hmm. And so we want to put ourselves in the context of where we're in healthy, you know, God-honoring community and, and being intentional about how we're growing closer to Jesus through that. Because the relationship that I have with others around me is going to directly influence the relationship that I have with Jesus, right? And so we want to be kind of thinking through this lens. And you also see, you know, throughout the New Testament as well, the church functioned in close-knit community. A lot of the churches were house churches. You can look in the book of Acts early on where the, the early movement of the church was meeting in large groups in temple courts and meeting in, in people's homes. And so I, I think we see it modeled. And, and really, a lot of what the New Testament tells us about what it looks like to function as a church can't be done unless you're in some type of smaller community, right? And, and so, again, it, it, it's not that we're opposed to, to larger groups, but it's just that we have to be intentional about kind of stepping into these places. And then on top of that, you know, if you step outside of what what scripture teaches and you look at, you know, social science and, and research and things along those lines of, of how we were created to connect and the dynamic, like we can, you know, we can only know so many people really well. Mm. And that, that level of closeness, the ability to have like an open candor with other people is so important. And then, so when we get into groups, a lot of times, even though we're kind of using the term groups generically, a lot of times we just refer to it as small groups. Mm. And Generally speaking, and this isn't a hard and fast rule, but most people, when they're talking about small groups, are talking about groups of 12 or less uh, and kind of that dynamic. And there's some social research of how communication dynamics within groups change once you get more than 12 people in a group and how it changes the nature of your communication and changes the nature of your relationship. So, so I think we understand human need, look at biblical uh, teaching around that. And then even if we look to social sciences, all of that kind of point to the importance of being in close relationship with other people helping us uh, in our lives. Yeah. And I think the relationship lens, as you're speaking to this, is what we have to uh, look through as we consider the the how of groups. And I think too often in ministries and parishes, we can take a very programmatic approach to groups, but we have to think people, not programs. It's about relationship, not pushing content. As we get into the how, I think we have to keep that in mind throughout as, as the lens that we're uh, looking at this, because it's easy to slip into a programmatic yeah. approach and, and mentality around that. Yeah. You don't want to be intentional. You want to have a structure, but your structure has to serve people. And a lot of times we make people serve the structure. Exactly. Right? And, and so thinking in terms of how do we help put enough in place to help people take next steps and, and, and serve them in it versus this is our agenda and we want to fill, fill people up with this agenda uh, in our churches. And so that can be subtle, but I think it makes a big difference in how we're thinking about you know, some of these next steps around these things. Yeah, how we're thinking, how we're communicating, how we're calling people to leadership, how we're <clears throat> inviting participants into groups, yeah. how we're inviting people to next steps after Alpha, whether it be in a leadership capacity or a participant capacity, it's all foundationally relational. Yeah. So part of the reason we're having this conversation is because churches are wondering, okay, how do I approach groups? What do I do next, especially after the Alpha experience and Alpha Online? We're experimenting with a few different things. And, and I'll stress the fact that, that the churches we're talking about, they're in, they're in seasons of experimentation yep. more than seasons of, hey, this is really working for us. It's, it's working in some ways, but, you know, as, as we'll be 
you know, hearing their stories, all of them are coming from a place of this is what we're trying. This is not what we figured out. So as we grapple now with what groups are going to look like in the future, uh, we're thinking about um, what makes a group balanced. So we've got five points that we think we'd like to ask each group to really be focusing on. And this will be what we're asking hosts and leaders to lean into and what we'll be training them in. And that's connecting, praying, growing, serving and reaching out. We think that if, if they're addressing those over the time, you know, not necessarily all of them to the same amount each week, but over time, that that will help a group to be really balanced. Now, if you've had many Alpha courses and you have some people who are looking for connection after Alpha, then, then that's where we found leaders from Alpha who were able to become online group leaders. And so that really is where we find most of our leaders. I mean, there's, there's always this tension though. We don't want to take all, all of our best leaders and put them to lead con connect groups or online groups and leave Alpha in a, a vulnerable position. You know, we want to make sure we have great leaders with Alpha. Like with groups and Alpha, how do we make sure that our efforts and the energy that we put towards groups doesn't uh, kind of cannibalize our alpha culture and experience? How do we yeah. make sure that as we build and grow groups, progress people through alpha into the, the next steps, uh, including alpha team, as we've talked about lots at yeah. Divine Innovation, how do we make sure um, that we keep the, the strength of the pump? Because if the pump shuts down in, in a few <clears> years, <throat> there's going to be no point talking about groups because there's going to be nobody going into them. Yeah. Ultimately, it's going to need to be like a leadership priority. Leaders are just going to need to keep their their focus around alpha first off and not not let their desire to create groups afterwards distract them from it so, so i'd say first of all it still needs to happen in kind of the mind of the leaders that it continues to be a priority S structurally and strategically from there <clears throat> trying to think through what's 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 a natural way to help people transition out of alpha and then what's a way that you can guide and shepherd them uh, into the next step. But one thing with, with uh, Alpha Online as well, we, we run Alpha with less leaders than we used to in person. So it's made more people be available to lead online groups. Um, for instance, we followed a model which would have four um, team members on Alpha when we were on site. So we would have a host and co-host and two helpers. Now that we are online, alpha groups usually have uh, one host and one helper. The helper role is a little different. So we've led most of our groups with two leaders. So as you can see there, there's a lot of people. We need less people to run alpha and it's provided more people available to help lead groups and to be a part of groups. One of the things that we're seeing probably changes is, is churches used to, you'd come through alpha and then afterwards, you'd kind of offer this smorgasbord approach like, hey, we want to help you take a next step. And, you know, you can come to mass and, uh, you know, you could uh, serve and we've got these different types of groups and we got these things that, you know, it's just all this this sort of stuff. right? Yeah. But churches now are shifting to what I call the Costco uh, principle, right? Like Costco. When you go to Costco, you got one option. Like if you want, there's the, the, one big thing of ketchup yeah, and that's you what you're want, getting. Yeah. There's five gallons of ketchup. You can buy it or not. Right. And so part of what churches are doing is they're narrowing the options uh, down to, instead of saying, these are the possible steps. The next step is this. Yeah. And they're making it easier for people from the standpoint of just trying to make a choice. Some things that we realize are going to be really important is our call to action at the end of Alpha. First of all, that we get that really, really clear in terms of we want you to join a life group or perhaps if we're moving into our Connect Series time to start a Connect Series group, which is that limited short term group. Uh, it means that we really need to be really careful about making sure that those who we want to come back on Alpha team have been approached and have been confirmed and they know that so there are no question marks in their mind moving forward. Uh, one of the other things is that we've found that with the Connect series that we ran this time is the people who want to continue on in a, in a group are mostly Alpha alumni anyway. So that makes it a really easy place to continue them. And also they're trying to be intentional of guiding them into the next step. A lot of our methodologies previously were really overthinking uh, sometimes and we had a really high bar of 
it's like, okay, you, you've experienced this. And then, but the next step is, is this. And it was a big jump for people. Easy. Yeah. yeah. And I'd say there's two things. It was, it was a big jump for people to get into them. And it was a big jump or it was a high bar for people to have to lead them. And I think fundamentally now people are saying, okay, uh, what can we do to make the step out of alpha into a group easier? And what can we do to make leadership of the group easier as well? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so th those are a couple of the fundamental differences that churches are starting to, to say now. So something that we've discovered uh, in our life groups over time too is how much people are enjoying um, having some content. And I think that's why we had an issue where people were going towards discipleship groups instead of life groups. We've been slowly adding content to our life groups and that's made a huge difference. People love learning a little bit more, growing in their understanding of discipleship and of church teaching and sacraments. Uh, but really um, doing that together and using that as a basis for their sharing and their life application. So that's something we want to continue and develop to get the right balance. It's that two-pronged approach of trying to create one group environment where you can connect in community, but you can also be discipled in. But I would say that they're still leading with community because the felt need that people have is relational. A lot of times it's not just information. And so they're, they're probably leading with community, but they're trying to combine community and discipleship together. Because here's the reality. When, when you examine when people leave churches, they don't leave churches because of a lack of information. They leave churches because of a lack of connection. Right. And so you want to position it to where you're helping people take a small step into a relational community, but you don't want it just to be about only about the community where people connect, drink coffee and talk about the weather and sports. You want it to be meaningful and you want it to help them to take next steps in their faith as well. Yeah. It needs to be intentional. The, the accompaniment of people in groups needs to be towards something so it can't just be sort of ad hoc so so parishes that i know have have um, set up their groups in a way that align with their discipleship pathway meaning guests who come out of alpha we have um, an intentional progression of them towards uh, in discipleship as you mentioned towards conversion towards a jesus-centered life and then in growth in holiness and mission we invite them intentionally yeah. in, into that I just want to loop back real quick with the uh, the alpha piece because a lot of churches are wondering, okay, what's next? And I, I would want to say even in a COVID world and a post-COVID world, all the principles that we talk about in alpha and alpha talks about still are maintained, meaning one of the best next steps for somebody who's participated in, in alpha is uh, alpha helper as a, a team. And we identify those people as we've shared in the past through their availability and their teachability. We identify people who are humble, who are teachable because part of a helper's role in alpha is sometimes in the first few weeks to just be silent, just to, to take it in and listen so that, you know, Joe or Susie across the table who have come to alpha as a guest and aren't going to say anything the first three weeks and we have guests like this, yeah. we want them to feel comfortable. And so a helper's role is to not say anything so that Joe across the, the room, across the table uh, or through video Zoom is not the only one saying nothing. Because if a new guest is the only one not saying anything in their small group, then they're not going to come back because yeah. this is obviously not for me. Yeah. And so we identify guests who are teachable, who uh, are humble to not speak necessarily in the first little while as a, as a helper and then contribute later as people get comfortable. Yeah. And then we invite them to hundred percent commitment. We say, can you make yourself available for this next alpha we're about to run? Meaning you are part of hosting somebody at this dinner, at this zoom call. And so we hope that our team will be able to be there as a, a helper in hosting that. So we identify teachability, which is expressed through certain humility as they approach. And then availability, they're going to, they can commit. And we've talked as well in the past about um, identifying leaders as fact, faithful, available, contagious, and teachable. But the really important thing with, with alpha helpers is maybe they're, they're not incredibly faithful at, at the moment. They're just coming in. Maybe they're unchurched. Maybe they don't have a lot of 
religious churchy background, but we want to help them progress closer to Jesus through making it part of their experience to be a helper on, on Alpha. And I would say too, along that line, like how do we continue to develop groups afterwards is, is I think, you know, we talk about the Alpha pipeline is we can, we can, we can extend the Alpha pipeline more intentionally beyond Alpha. Cause a lot of times it was like, well, then, then you just graduate them off and they, they find somewhere else in the church. And now I think there's, there's an opportunity to, to just keep the pipeline going, say, okay, you've led an alpha group now for one, two, how many sessions, and then transition them out into more intentional small group leadership uh, as, as a way of, of identifying leaders. Also part of what you're seeing as well is fundamentally changing the opportunity for people to step into leadership, maybe even if they're not from the alpha pipeline as well. And so while there can be a natural progression as a way to find leaders that way, I think you can also begin to develop leaders in other ways as, as well along with that. And one of the basic approaches that you're seeing a lot of churches experiment with now is the approach that Saddleback Community Church, where the pastor uh, by the name of Rick Warren, his small group pastor, Steve Gladen, has written you know a bunch of material on small groups. And, and mm. they run their groups in a slightly different way in the fact that they're always inviting people to experience small groups through short-term opportunities. And in that, they're allowing people to lead small groups with short-term, um, with their short-term opportunities, and they'll let anybody lead them, right? With the idea that the short-term, exp- with the short-term group is a way that you can step into groups. But if you want to continue leading long-term, there's a specific developmental process that you have to get into. Mm. And that's a fundamental shift from how a lot of our churches have thought about groups and the fact that, you know, we have a very high bar for leaders. We vet our leaders. We make sure that we have the best leaders, you know, in place. And then what we do is we get in that and then we try to match make. Okay, we've got leader. We've got one leader here and we've got all these disconnected people here. And what does it look like to bring this together and form it into a group? And and, and those work sometimes. You know, the, those aren't utter failures by any stretch of the imagination. But it can be very challenging and it can be awkward. So we just tried to really empower people. You know, here's resources. You can do it. We all connected with them in Zoom, did a training session. And then um, we, we set up the groups on our website. And uh, all the groups were listed with the leader, uh, the demographic, the day they met. And really we left it at, for people who, to go to the website and to just express interest in a group. And the email would go straight to the group leaders and then we would get a copy but we didn't want to get caught up in the middle of trying to fit people to a group we wanted just to connect people put interested people with the group leaders and, and then they were able to follow up with information and, and answer any questions they had when you shift your philosophy and say hey for a short season anybody can lead a group what that does is it allows leaders to step in and identify the community that already exists and to build a small group around them so, yeah. so we're dealing with a couple of different things here. Is we're talking about how do we form small groups and how does that come together with Alpha? And again, this is where churches are experimenting mm-hmm. with this. So we don't necessarily have this perfect dovetailed approach to this <laughs> that comes together. They're just sort of, they're, they're keeping these things in tension to where you can do a much better job of capturing people coming out of, out of Alpha, but you can also form other groups kind of in this second stream as well into into a similar approach yeah and that's what saddleback does don't they they do groups campaigns and as you pointed out i think they the language that they use around those campaigns is that people host a a group and so they provide the content they provide um the structure and then they say find two friends yeah and you'll host a group you're not a leader they might not be explicit with that but they're not. They're hosting a group, inviting people to come in. Yeah. And then, as you say, they invite some hosts to consider leading a group. And so there's, a, as you say, a progression, a certain commitment that's necessary, uh, perhaps an identification of leadership potential from the church. And then they move from hosting a campaign group into leading a small group at the church. There's a few different elements at work. And again, this is where it's purely experimental yeah. uh, around this, this sort of thing. But, but yeah, like what does it, what does it look like to, to give people a short-term 
uh, experience of maybe participating in a group or participating in a group that isn't an alpha group. Mm. Uh, what does it look like to give people short term, you know, experiment to step into leadership, although we wouldn't use that term, but it is a short term leadership role. And and in that, for people that are kind of freaking out, that's part of where there's there's very high accountability around the material that they use. So the material creates the accountability as opposed to having a leader that's got their act together in a way that kind of knows how they need to be functioning yeah. in the middle of that as well. So I would say some of the principles apply to alpha, as you're saying, relationally, because I've been part of both types of post alpha groups, the kind that I would be leading and just people from different um, tables or groups in the alpha come together. And that's really challenging because you don't have the kind of relational um, bank account that you would have with with uh, people that you know, people that you've journeyed with through alpha. So I've been in a group that's just sort of a, a, a mashup of a few different groups. And that, like you said, can work, but is challenging. And I've also been part of a group of folks from my own alpha table um, that we go on and lead a group and and I have invited a few people that I know as well. So relationally, there's an ease there that wouldn't necessarily be present when, as you say, you're trying to do the matchmaking yeah. piece. So I think leaders, we have to keep that in mind as we consider groups is how relationally might this um, unfold and how can I um, invite people through the relationships that I have and that they have with, with yeah. others? Well, and, you know, around that principle, I, I did youth ministry for a number of years. And it was so funny because whenever you would announce you're taking the youth group on a trip or doing something, the first question you always got is, who else is going? And I always remember teenagers being that way. But the funny thing is, the more when I stepped out of youth ministry and the more that I worked directly with adults, here's the reality. We're a little more subtle about it, but we ask the exact same questions as adults. Who else is going to be there? So once you start talking about small groups... All of a sudden, everybody's fear and anxiety. Well, uh, the idea of, of hanging out with people I like sounds fun and enjoyable. But what if I get stuck in this thing that, that you know, people I don't? And so what you're doing is you're kind of reversing that principle. Instead of getting people to commit to this environment where there's a bunch of unknowns in, in terms of who's going to be there, or who's not going to be there. You just give them the freedom to say, hey, who do you already like? Yeah. Yeah. Steve Gladen <laughs> talks about that in uh, a story he tells about somebody saying, well, do, you, do your group meet over the summer? And he says, um, do you get together with your friends over the summer? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same principle, relationally yeah. driven. See, that would be an indication to me of a programmatic approach to groups. Yeah. Whereas we're, again, trying to iterate, reiterate a relational approach to groups. That these are uh, my friends. There's people that I'm getting to know better for sure. But, but there's a relationship there that allows us together to progress intentionally towards a Jesus centered life and ongoing growth in missionary discipleship. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'd be curious to know, Eric, cause hey, man, come on. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be curious to know, Eric, because, cause again, we've, we've, we've emphasized that we have some of our churches experimenting and, and through some of your different roles, you've interacted with some of these churches as well. What are some of the things that are still unknown? Like what are the, what are the tensions that these churches are a little bit more that are stepping into it's like ah we don't 100 percent know how that's going to work or we're not we're unsure like what, what's that looking like for churches yeah i think some of the big questions are how do we recruit and identify leaders like how do i go from a host of a group to a leader of a group i would say the other big issue that churches are dealing with is how am i as a as a leader in a parish maybe in charge of groups how am i supposed to accompany <clears throat> the leaders who are accompanying their participants in groups yeah. because in some situations that there would be a one to 20 ratio of how many groups i'm responsible for and mm. leading yeah. so how do i help and support each leader in their own discipleship growth but more importantly i would say how do we help the leader to be intentional with their participants um to make sure that they're invited into ongoing conversion, ongoing uh, growth in missionary discipleship. Yeah. And again, in what we spoke to as well, like, like, yeah, you let someone lead for a short period of time. And then what does the next steps after that look like? I think there's a little bit of still kind of wrestling with some of that stuff as well. And that that's probably a piece that some of the people watch this video will be the most un, you know, have the most unease about probably. Yeah. And I know some churches are experimenting with a more intentional accompaniment, even through, through alpha of, the alpha hosts. I know that they're 
They're checking in with the host towards the end of alpha to say, hey, what perhaps would be a next step for the guest in your group? Um, how are they going to engage next to have a conversation with the host about each of their participants so that there's nobody going out the back door, you know, that they come in through alpha, but then too often we lose connection with them. And so I think what, what churches are experimenting with is a discussion with their hosts around uh, their participants. Where are these people in their life with Jesus and in relationship to the church? What perhaps could be the next best step for them towards Christ and the church? How might you as a host help facilitate that next step? These are the kind of questions that, I mean, in Alpha and the hosts, um, but also translate over to groups to, to ask, where are, is this person spiritually? What is the Lord doing to bring them to next? And how might you as a leader support and help what God is doing in this person's life to help make that happen? Cool. Anything else, Eric, that you think pastors and church leaders out there would want to be aware of around, you know, some of the essentials of beginning to take some steps into this direction. Okay. Yeah. Rob, you, you spoke about the campaign. Can you tell us a little bit more about the group's campaign? Yeah. So th there's a couple different things that we're fundamentally talking about here is one is a lot of churches are experimenting with the actual structure of a group. Uh, what does it mean to be a group? How do they function with inside? Then there's another, you know, kind of um, method of how you get people into groups and again, this is where it can get a little bit messy because you may try to just transition people after alpha. And that's one way to do it. Another thing that, that some of our churches that are experimenting with, they're, they're trying to do what they call the churchwide campaign, where you're calling the whole church to get into a group for a, a short season. In the fall, we decided to do something called a life group campaign, which we had never done before. Uh, campaign being um, almost like dipping your toe in to a group. It was, it was a seven week uh, video series. And we invited everybody uh, in our church uh, to, to, to host a group, invite two or more of their friends, and we would supply uh, the video content of the small group questions, and they would be encouraged to meet uh, weekly or even bi-weekly um, to go through the content, get to know each other, grow closer together, um, with, with the hope of that, that if they enjoyed that small group, life group time, that they would actually graduate, uh, continue on, and, and become a life group at St. Benedict Parish. We're just now having people sort of finish the, the, uh, the campaign. And, and we're seeing um, right now what 50% are actually moving into a, uh, a permanent life group. A lot of churches that are doing the church-wide campaign are doing that through the pastor planning out his messages and creating discussion material around the pastor's homilies. And then in that, they're trying to align everything that's happening with groups with what's happening with the homily on Sunday. And so everybody in the church is going through the same material. So when we talk about, you know, kind of sermon-based material or when we talk about, you know, the, the, the church-wide campaign, um, that's one method. And then so, so we're really talking about a couple of things. Yeah, some churches are experimenting with different types of content. I would say fundamentally, again, it's about intentionality. We, especially for folks coming out of Alpha, we want to continue to invite them into a Jesus-centered life. We want them to know and experience the fruit of a relationship with Christ, and then to progress in holiness and in the sense of mission and, and belonging to the church. And so a few different parishes have taken different approaches to this. Some parishes I know have made, as you mentioned briefly, their, their own material that aligns with the discipleship pathway that uh, they've laid out in their vision of the parish. Some parishes have offered a very experientially similar content for their groups post alpha, a video, some discussion, just to lower that bar, as you mentioned, into groups. Some other folks have used faith studies from CCO, Catholic Christian Outreach, which is an invitation to that relationship with Christ. And then a systematic progression in a life of holiness and mission and introduces the sacramental life. Um, in a very relatable and, and uh, concrete way. And so these different content offerings from different churches are helping people engage further in the life of the church and their relationship with Jesus. And the intentionality that is available through these means from leaders and those folks who are helping and coaching those leaders is really important. 
And all these examples of content uh, have a few similarities. Uh, they're super easy to uh, lead or host, and they meet people in a place where they can come off of alpha and engage in a very similar discussion and conversation as they begin their continued discipleship in the life of the church. Yeah. The, the words are important there because you, know, you say the word lead when somebody hasn't really led before, that becomes a pretty intimidating um, word. So we ask them to host. You know, it's going to be you. It's going to be two of your friends. So the comfort level will be there because you're inviting them. And, and all the content and all that will be supplied to you. Like, and, and it's not a teaching environment. It's a, it's a sharing environment. You can bring your doubts. We hope you bring your doubts to all that. And we just kick it around. And, and, and inevitably, you know, the richness of those conversations happens. Most of these probably follow in the path of Alpha in the sense that at Alpha, you don't want people to teach. You want people to facilitate. And I'd say in, in a lot of these groups, there's kind of that similar dynamic. You're still not looking for teachers. You're looking for facilitators. And how do you make it easy to step in and, and have these conversations and create these environments uh, for people in them? Yeah, because for new leaders, hosting uh, a discussion is a lot easier and less intimidating than, as you're saying, leading something. So I think, yeah, the commonality in these resources is that the leadership bar is very low. And so people can step into a hosting role in a very unintimidating way um, to facilitate a discussion uh, among participants that progress them closer to Christ and further in their discipleship. So some churches are asking, how do we get people in groups? And like we talked about, Alpha is a great way. Participants of Alpha or folks who have been on Alpha team, perhaps for a few rounds who have been serving on team, can go into groups. Let's talk about some other ways that people can be welcomed into groups. This is where um, you're seeing you're seeing churches kind of change the structure of the group, but the 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 campaign uh, aspect is where you're trying to put a high level of focus on groups, and you're in, you're asking everybody in the church. Uh, to step into groups for like a six week season with the idea of of kind of testing groups out for for lack of a better term and experimenting with them. Our parish priest, Chris, uh, asked all of the staff what was the one most important thing that they thought we needed to get right before Christmas. That was in about August or September. And nearly everyone spoke about the same thing, that sense of disconnection that people had not being able to come back to church or being too afraid to come back to church so that's when we decided to run a connect series based on the saddleback sort of model of group of a group campaign more like a light version of that though um, it was based on the weekly homily it went for five weeks and we invited people to start a group with someone that they knew and it only, only had to be three people. So you could invite a friend, a family member. Once you had three of you, you were a group. The general direction that, that many churches are going to is, is a model of you and inviting two friends. So uh, in terms of finding leaders, um, the, 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 the hope and the expectation and the challenge we give to everybody who's, who's a member of our church is if, if this church has blessed you in any way and you've got two friends, we'd like you to host a group. And, and the hosting part is the campaign, is that small, you know, dip your toe in the water. In, in our case, it was a seven week campaign. Um, but we're asking people who potentially haven't led in our church uh, even to, to, to give that a little bit of a try. By the end of the campaign, now we're obviously introducing the idea that if you enjoyed the last seven weeks, why don't you become a life group? At that point, sort of the, the host label becomes a, a, a leader label. Um, but with the promise of and the expectation that we're going to continue to walk with you. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to develop you as a leader to make sure that you've got all the tools you need um, to, to feel comfortable in, in leading that small group. If they're scared of getting into a group for a long period of time. And so what you're doing uh, around that is, in, in some cases, depending on how they roll it out, some churches in a pre-COVID world that were using this as a strategy shut everything else down in the church, only did groups. And you're asking everybody to get into a group for a six week period of time uh, and to focus on a particular topic that everyone else is studying. And normally the homily around the weekend would line up with whatever the, the small group material is. So you're hearing it from the you're hearing it you know, from the pastor preaching uh, and then you're discussing it in your small groups. And so it's really kind of driving the point home. 
part of that is is everybody's focusing in on it. You're you're ramping up a bunch of groups. It's easy to get into a group, experiment for a season with the idea that you're going to invite them to to potentially stay together as a group afterwards. Now, does everybody? No. But what churches do is they see an increased level of small group involvement after the campaign than they had before it. And then that way, you then you begin to form long-term groups uh, that continue to stay together for a while. And then it comes back around and, you know, typically they'll fall, they'll do this on a one-year cycle where, again, the next year they invite again a small group campaign uh, for everybody to step into that, whether that's new people in the church or people that did it the year year previously, with with the idea that retention is higher after you come out of the campaign than it was before. So that's another thing some churches are experimenting with is this hyper focus on inviting people into groups in a in a very focused way for a certain amount of time. We're not doing anything else, and the pandemic kind of lends to shutting stuff down and yeah. uh, <laughs> trying and experimenting yeah. with new things. And that's one of the things people are doing is, is a campaign. Okay. As a, as an entire parish, we're going to try this for yeah. the next six weeks. It was based on the weekly homily. It went for five weeks and we invited people to start a group with someone that they knew and it only only had to be three people. So you could invite a friend, a family member. Once you had three of you, you were a group. But we also did have an option to form groups for those people who weren't approached by anyone, who didn't know anyone. Uh, and then we formed groups for them and we tapped people on the shoulder that we within those groups that we thought would be good hosts. We set the bar really low for being hosts so that people didn't find it too scary or challenging. Uh, it lends well too to, you know, um, maybe a Lenten series or a, a, a summer series or something like that, that, yeah. that people can participate in. Yeah. And, and, and part of what we're seeing as well in this season is a hybrid approach. So depending on where you are uh, in the midst of this pandemic, uh, you're seeing some churches where they, they have restrictions, but they can still create groups in person. You're also seeing the dynamic of people finding online groups really helpful. Uh, and so it gives you the opportunity to form a group with people who maybe don't geographically live close to you, or maybe a person likes to be in a group that has young children and childcare is a challenge. And so you're able to, you know, uh, enter into a, a small group experience. So in the midst of this as well, we're seeing both kind of the, the online reality and the in-person reality, like one church, you know, I was talking about as they rolled out this kind of new approach, they said, yeah, about 60% of our groups are in person and about 40% are online. And so it, it just, so it, th this, this type of structure lends itself to online because, because typically in an in-person small group, you can have 10, you know, I talked earlier about, you know, a small group being up to 12, you can, you know, and, and groups get larger than that. And you, there's still ways to manage it. Typically in online, 12 people online is, is, is a lot more challenging mm -hmm. uh, as far as, so it gives you that opportunity to, to still step into a structure where you might have five, six, seven people in a small group and it's still being a fairly, you know, um, well-functioning small group. So w within this structure, it gives you the freedom, I think, as well, or, or some of these structural changes that they're making to have both in-person and online uh, kind of a presence within groups as well. Yeah, I would agree not to write off the online group thing too quickly because um, I, <clears throat> I started a, a new online group a few weeks ago and it, it's, I'm not going to pretend it's the same as being in person because yeah. there's just some, there's some subtleties yeah. of being together and that kind of thing. But the online group was surprisingly not lame. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it allows for uh, a, a connection. Um, it allows for you to process a little bit of uh, content um, it allows for thoughtful questions and feedback. Like you say, if it gets too big, especially yeah. online, it's tricky to kind of have that dynamic, yeah. but like w mine's a group of six and it's perfect. We're progressing through uh, a six week study yeah. and, uh, and it's really, um, encouraging and I'm able to, to help those who have otherwise been disconnected to connect in. It's been awesome. Yeah. But but the the more flexible approach allows much more even flexibility of whether you're you're in person or not as well. And, and again, largely, you know, you you lead largely the same way online. There's a few different dynamics of kind of the interactions and now they have to take place. But for the most part, this model translates uh, in in the different environments really well. And, and, and I would say that probably one of the most important things that, that any church leader could take away from this is just step into this and begin trying it 
as opposed to, okay, what's the perfect uh, strategy out there that, that I can apply 100% to my context that will work? You know, if that's your mindset, then, you know, don't watch this, wait for three years. Cause you know, it's just going to be, and even then when we think we've got it figured out, things are going to change anyways, even there. So yep. we just need to be willing to step into these, these places and roll the dice a little bit more and experiment more around some of these, these strategies moving forward. Yeah. Perfection is the enemy of progress. Right. Yeah. As Winston Churchill said. Okay. That's good. It's pretty good. Eh? Uh, very impressive. Very I, impressive. I like that. Yeah. So we have to just try sometimes yeah. like, like we have to just give it a go, learn from our <laughs> mistakes. Uh, John Maxwell said, if you want to double your productivity, double your mistakes. Yeah. So we just have to do something, pray like crazy, do our best and see <clears throat> where there's fruitfulness and then go where there's fruitfulness. Cause that's where the Lord is leading. Yeah. The whole topic of groups, you know, how do you create a, a group model, connect groups or, or life groups in the parish? that can scale over time is, is a huge topic that takes time to develop, to get processes in place, to raise up leaders. And so that's a big issue, but we've just found with COVID, with a the pandemic, there's a lot, there's an opportunity here. And so we, we just kind of stepped into it. You know, we, and, and, and it's helped us move along now that I think we're better positioned for to re-engage with our long-term connect group strategy. So, you know, just encourage you to um, find a model, find a parish, um, find resources and uh, yeah, and don't overthink it. Just just uh, step into it and, and see what God can do. If you are hesitant to yeah. uh, start an online group, it, it, there, like you said, it's so much easier in so many ways. Yeah. It's fun to just begin to thinking through how we can experiment, how we can try some new things. Clearly, I know that as people are watching this, they're they're just thinking to themselves, "What about this? And what about this?" And there's there's all kinds of questions, and really, a lot some of them we we don't have the answers to because this is just we're kind of on the front edge experimenting uh, with this, and so hopefully today's time will be very beneficial for you. And, and give you a, a little bit of a context to begin moving forward in this area.